Hi, I'm David Eichholz at David Richard Gallery located in New York City, and today I'm with Roland Gebhardt. And we are standing in the second floor gallery space, which uh, we just installed with um, his uh, most recent uh, solo exhibition, uh, which opens in a couple days here uh, on Wednesday, and it's called Diverse Dialogues. And what we're gonna do is walk you through the exhibition, not every aspect of it, but conceptually and show you sort of the lay of the land and what we're trying to, to do in this presentation. Um, it's sort of a follow-up, and for those of you who saw the presentation about 18 months ago, this is a follow-up to one that we did that literally was as the pandemic was kind of coming on and closed like five days before the shutdown here in New York. So it really didn't give us a chance to get the museum people and curators and collectors and people in, you know, because it was also winter, you know, that we had wanted. And so um, what we decided to do was the main feature of that show was a new work. And um, it was these wood columns that are here. And what we've done is it was a, uh, it was an installation actually in the same space. It was kind of right through here. And it was 49 of these columns. And they were arranged in a way so that from different perspectives you could see, um, well, I should preface by saying that they are sort of serial, which is the way Roland typically operates, where he makes these cuts or to create these voids. And he cuts on different sides. And so when you look at these different ways, you see different cuts and you see the different permutations. Right. And that's his way of sort of working through uh, a conceptual and um, an aesthetic um, set of parameters that he set to explore the voids and how voids operate within an object and between objects, related objects. Right. And so what we decided to do is, um, and that was set up so that you could walk through the rows. I forget how many rows there were, but anyway, it was set up so that people could walk through it and because it, it was quite wide. And, uh, but what we decided to do was take that same, because um, they were all um, made individually but conceived serially, and each of these sort of um, sets of cuts that are related, he considers a family. And the whole group collectively that we presented last year was the entire tribe, exactly. which was consists of seven yeah. or eight families. Yeah, yeah. One aspect. Well, of that was a question. Was it seven or eight families? Um, there were nine. Oh, nine families. Nine. Okay. Yeah. And they varied from as few as four or five up to, I think, eight or nine is eight, the Eight or nine, yes. Exactly. And so what yeah. we're presenting here then is we're sort of deconstructing that bigger piece and presenting just four of the families in relationship to with some of these wall pieces. And what's the nuance in this exhibition that we picked up on and thought about as over the pandemic, Roland started working on some newer work, which was still a follow on of things that he'd been doing in the past. But what we thought we would do in this show was break this down in two ways, deconstruct his, that particular set of objects, those wood columns and his practice to deconstruct it into to, to two things. One is the families so that you could see what the differences were that he was exploring and then how they all came together collectively. And these were all sold separately, but they obviously work really great in these pairings. And so that's how we're presenting them so that people can kind of see that in a more uh, bite-sized look. The other thing is the, um, the fact that, and Roland refers to these cuts, these literal cuts into the object, in this case wood, as uh, dimensional voids. But you can create the same thing, the same effect often, with just black paint on, on, on the same objects. And that's what we're pairing up and showing in this exhibition. And that's the subtle nuance that we really didn't point out in the last show, that we felt like this would really be a great sort of didactic way of doing this. Yeah, exactly. And so that's, this is a great example. And I'm just gonna walk, you just stay there and I'm just gonna walk over so people can see. So this is a triptych. This is a wall sculpture. It's three uh, large sheets of a real heavy uh, paper with deckled edges. And what Roland had done is create a cut in here, a literal cut between two, 
And then here, it's painted with a very super matte black paint that basically echoes that. And so when you stand back and just sort of look at it, at a glance, you see these two parallel lines and they, they read very similar. Now when you get up close, you see, because of the dimensionality of the paper relative to the wall, you see cast shadows on the one and then the void, or in the, the one that's painted is very matte, so you don't see any of that. But from a distance, they read the same. And so what Roland's done is, is included in here, and we'll get to the one in, behind us in more detail, but um, a number of his different works, both as other columns or as a, a larger sort of wall relief or other works on paper that use uh, both the dimensional void and the sort of painted or graphic void, which is the way he thinks about it, and how they operate the same in terms of how we perceive it. Yes. And that's the subtle nuance here and sort of the didactic part of this exhibition yeah, to kind of break down two elements of, of your work. It's basically uh, expressing the same idea with two different languages. Exactly. Or vocabularies. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> so, and that's hence the name of the show, uh, Diverse Vocabularies, because it, you, you see, you, the optical effect, and I hate to use the word optical, because this work isn't intended to be illusory or optical per se, but there is an inherent opticality that comes about, and especially when you have two things side by side, like some of these other pieces that we're gonna get to, where the void is literal, but you get the same visual effect from the painted. So there is an opticality there, and which I hate to use that word because we also think of your work as very reductive, very minimalist, and very clean, which is what you have to do when you want to explore. Something didactically, yes. Yeah, something very didactically. You can't have a lot of color. You don't want to have a lot of diversity in shape. So your, your forms typically are very elemental. They're very yeah. primary. And your palette is very, really not even primary, because that would be red, blue, and yellow in the, in the artistic vernacular. But you, you keep things white, black, natural. And, um, and your, your um, elements are, are basic art elements, but in a very um, non-ornamented or <laughs> you know, trumped up sort of way. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's, it's steel, it's mm -hmm. aluminum, it's paper, it's right. wood. Right. So, um, so it, it keeps it really reductive. So you're not a minimalist per se, uh, in the in the sense of like you know, um, Carl Andre and no, and no, um, no, no, no. and Judd and what have you, but you do tilt that way a lot. You know, your work so is very clean. My aesthetic comes from there. So that's you what? my aesthetic. Uh, yeah, yeah. Assume comes comes uh, that way. Yeah. But there still is additional content or uh, narrative. Uh, to be expressed with that vocabulary. Correct. <clears throat> and there is where you start, start departing. <laughs> and, uh, but a lot of your work is um, very prescriptive in that regard and that it's, um, anybody could make it if they had the, the exact dimensions and, and, and uh, what sort of I'm looking for, formula or whatever. Right. Yeah, and but so that's... it's reproducible, and so that way it's very much like minimalism, and it's, you know, and somebody else could, yeah. could do it. It's like you think of Solowit and his instructions with the wall painting. Actually, each one of these pieces, if I were to give you the formula, for, uh, if I were to give you the formula for these right, pieces, right. you could only reproduce a sculpture in these proportions and in, in, uh, with these volumetric uh, relationships. Right. And um, this, these all, the families are all, of most of my work, uh, uses the voids in ha as half sections, ha half sectional explorations of the volume they are placed into. And with that, you automatically have the full information, dimensional information of uh, the, the volume. But it gives it a totally different uh, dynamic. But what do you mean half volume? Half, so half section, half sections. Half section. sections. This incision is done in a form of an architectural half section. So it's the answering one on the other side. It's the what on the other side? The answering. The answering. Right. 
So there are two half sections into each one of these volumes composed out of two components. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so with that, you have the full geometric information with these two half sections. You get the full volumetric information about the volume. Oh, yes. OK, I, I get what you're saying now. Yeah. And okay. then the, 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 mm -hmm. uh, the other aspect mm -hmm. of the voids here is that they connect two different volumes and alter the identity mm -hmm. of each one of the volumes. So there is a, there is a, a complex narrative behind uh, um, this, this aspect. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, all right. So, we, well, we, you had never mentioned that before, but I had noticed it just because I was looking at them yeah. more carefully probably than the average bear. But, uh, but I, I, so the point you're making is, is there's really just one plane Exactly. That, yes. okay, is there, it's not, they're yes. not planar in two dimensions. And the mechanical yeah. function of that yeah. void then guarantees that plane. Exactly. So, um, yeah, because when you look at these, some of these others, yeah, okay. Although these become challenging, this group, because it's not as obvious. No, it is not. Because so the, is this the plane? Uh, or is, which is this? This, this would be, no, uh, the plane for this void is with these two sides. For this void, it's with these two sides. That's what I thought. So this one's defined exactly. by the top element, right. whereas these are not. So these, these, okay. this family is way more intellectual than this family. OK, we're getting probably way too intellectual <laughs> for people who are listening to this. So anyway, but that was sort of an interesting little segue. Huh? But because uh, every time I talk to you, I learn something more about these. But you've been doing this for, what, 50 years? I mean, this something sort of work. Like and yeah, so yeah. Um, not to give away your age or anything, oh, but yeah. you started very young. <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> on ancient. <laughs> Remember that horse drawing you did for your mom? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyway. It was uh, yesterday. We'll, we'll make that as the starting point. But um, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. And, uh, but no, that's what's interesting about your work is you've, you, and as part of what I'm doing in this chapter that I'm writing about you is, is it's hard to sum your stuff up um, too simplistically because there is a lot of complexity because when you start thinking about objects in space and objects in a space and objects interrelating inter with one another, um, it, it gets complex. And what it reminds me a lot of is, um, you know, I, I love the, the artists from the Park Place Gallery, you know, from here in New York back in the early 60s. Mm -hmm. You know, Mark DeSouvre was part of that, Dean Fleming and yeah. David Novros and, you know, so uh, you know, a whole myriad of, of interesting, really uh, complex artists. But what held that group together was five painters and five sculptors was um, their interest in the complexity of space and how you convey the complexity of space. And, um, and they, they loved vector geometry and Buckminster Fuller. And back then, you know, there's that whole you know, notion around the potential of a fourth dimension and things like that. And so artists, including yourself, have struggled for a long time. How do you convey this visually? How do you convey this you know, in a way um, visually for people to sort of grasp with it or, or grapple with it. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so I think that's what, um, but, but what's nice is your work has is just this cleanliness about it and just simplicity because you have to keep it simple to think through things as complex. Well, you want to, 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 to invite the viewer into, into the methodology or in, into right. the... Right, uh, which is why the seriality is quite nice because right. people tend to... And that's why it was nice for us, I think, when I, I talked to you about, would you mind if we broke this down? Because I think people, um, when we had all 49 together, it was a little hard for people to sort of it grapple with very, it. And so, but this, I think, really uh, deconstructs it and breaks it down. It makes this presentation more complex um, which is the antithesis of what we've been saying about you and your process. But I think um, what we're trying to do is deliberately is to make this somewhat didactic. And so for people to really um, get the hang of really your practice by focusing just on sort of two elements of it, you know, and really right. the, the one element is, is this, the graphic versus dimensionality right. of the voids, but it's this interaction between objects and how they have this dialogue between them. So what's interesting about these works is even though these are from a distance and they're from different series or different thought processes, they're still held together pretty tightly. But what's interesting is in this room, 
you see these angled voids and you see these angled uh, graphics and they, you inherently get that they're related. And that's what's nice about it, is it sort of is making the argument for you that the diversity in the materials and the fact that one's painted or not painted or, or carved, if you will, to use a clunky term, but, um, you know, they, they, they still have a, a, a dialogue between each other. Yeah. And especially when you look at these in relationship to that, um, those two on the pedestal, which I should be pointing to because people, it's around the corner, people can't see them, but they're a lot like that two on the pedestal over there. So that's, I think, the interesting thing is it sort of makes the argument for you um, the way we've set this up in vignettes that people can see the interaction between these different materials and whether they be a wall piece or a pedestal piece or a floor piece, this geometry is pervasive throughout all of your work. Right, yes. And you're, you wouldn't, you're, and you're very systematic in your approach. And part of it, what I think it is too, and this is, I'm positing something, and, but it's also sort of a question. So is the seriality, because you're not really sure what the answer is, because it seems like when you do the serial approach with these very subtle sort of permutations, it's almost like it's, a, it's an experiment. And, and, and is that sort of how you resolve things? Or do you sort of already know the answer anyway, but you're doing it to present it to other people? So how much of this is sort of empirical for you versus... A is a, a presentation or demonstration. See what I mean? It's a, it's a demonstration of having to sort things out. I'm dyslexic. So, oh, uh, I, so I, I really, in order to participate in this world, I have to put everything into an order that I can reach uh, intellectually. And with, uh, that then becomes a tool to communicate with. Mm -hmm. So I need to, before I speak, I need to structure my sentences, and, um, which is sometimes not easy for dyslexic. So it is an exercise. Mm -hmm. So maybe some of that comes out of that habit. Uh, um, and it's a fabulous tool to do things in series mm -hmm. and keep them clearly separated. Or if, if you can't do that, create links. For example, I don't know which family is what, but this piece, particular piece has one character in it that is the link to that next family. Mm. That, makes it, that makes those two, fam those two families I members see. of the same tribe. Okay, that I did not realize, but it makes sense. Yeah, no, that's, that's actually quite helpful. Um, and I just figured out what it is. Yeah. It's the angle in that notch in the top part. Okay. So, all right, so I'll have to kind of look Actually, at this. Actually, that, this would be a better example. Yeah. yeah. These two families. These two yeah. right here. They're easier to read, easier to read. Right. Yeah. You know, to get out of the way for people to look at this one. And so, yeah, they are. They're very interesting just aesthetically because, first of all, the, the grain of the wood is, is beautiful because they're just natural right and um and for in case you can't see in the video what he's pointing to is there are two pieces there's this little cube sitting on top of the column and so the column is so, and they're they're affixed right they're glued right yeah. now they're glued yes. yeah yeah and so um it, it just sort of uh, breaks up sort of uh the, it gives you two things within an element within uh, a, an, an object, and now they have this dialogue between objects. And now right. what we've been talking about is they're having a dialogue between the family and with other things in, in the same space. Right. Right. So it all just sort of keeps... Exactly. Then it, it also comes to mixing materials in one piece of, uh, right. of, of, of sculpture and, uh, so that the narrative can be expanded with this, with this minimalist vocabulary. Right. So. Let's just go back to, to this piece here then. So, Yao, can you, is it possible to zoom in a bit here? Okay. So, this, when we were talking about the, uh, the constellation, or if you will, or the tribe that we had in this space, it kind of went from that column, <clears throat> I think, over to like here. And it was like seven rows, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe 
six. I don't remember anyway. It was quite large, and it looked really cool. Yeah. This is like an aerial view of what that's not exactly what it looked like because this is a square, exactly. and what we had that's was a, yeah. they were that was a, yeah. a much more rectangular shape. But this is an aerial view of what that sort of looked like. And um, but what's nice is with this one being painted black and white, you can really see now when you stand here at different angles you can see what your permutations were and how they traverse across. And, um, and, and so this is a very nice illustrative uh, piece that shows in a bird's eye view mm -hmm. of what these look like and what you're trying to resolve into a certain extent. It also becomes very optical and very trippy you know, when you look at it from an angle and yeah. you see all of this together. Yeah. So it's just, you know, this pattern on pattern on pattern, yeah. layer on layer on layer. And the other thing too is, is because of these extreme perspectival angles, you know, that you use, which basically uh, really has an opticality about it because it really cuts the piece in a very... Has a clarity to it. Yeah. Yes, and invites then the exploration of the logic behind it. Uh, but that comes out of schooling, not of, out of in, in, uh, uh, instinct. Um, so this one, was this ever realized as a four piece or did you always just think of, because there's a couple hanging in your studio of different materials and what have you, but right. obviously this is a, a favorite concept and I do know you did those huge columns, which I think there were nine of, that when we did the video you had the mock-ups that are now being right. realized right. In, in aluminum Exactly. in an outdoor installation someplace. Right, right. But these were sort of like a, the nine that you did are like a microcosm of these, but blown away up. Exactly, it was a family. Yeah, yes. but so express one family. Graphic, ex express graphically. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the other thing too, is your practice for people who had, had, uh, may not know, is it involves, you know, boulders, and um, stones and books. Vegetables. Vegetables. <laughs> and uh, so over the years, there's been quite a few things. And, uh, and then a lot of it is, is uh, a gallery practice, but you have done an enormous number of pieces, outdoor pieces. Not and, an enormous, um, but quite a few. Yeah, yes. so Storm King, I think Storm there's King Arts one. And yes. you're doing some um, private uh, commissions and things right exactly. now. Exactly. So yes. that are outdoor works. So it's. Um, it, it, it's a, a very diverse practice mm -hmm. and scale. Um, I'm thinking about that piece that um, Guillaume showed, oh gosh, it's probably went about four or five years ago, upstairs next door, that really long, really big sheet of um, galvanized. It's like 10 feet by like, I don't know, six, and it's got that angle, the void in the, for that one. Oh, that one, that, yes, that was in, yeah, and when, Guillaume had to go away next to Yeah, yes. yeah. I mean, um, so again, your scale can get quite large. Right, and the, the, the interaction with the, with, with the space that is created in a volume mm -hmm. um, uh, is totally different. And the, uh, the, the space that I, in that particular piece, the space that I, the space of the gallery that I permitted to, tra to, to transit through the piece, mm -hmm made this space part of the piece. So it is not a, uh, a self-standing piece. It invites the, the, uh, the gallery envelope into the space of the, of the sculpture. Do you think of that then, because I was pondering this earlier today when I was writing about your stuff. Um, do you, you, never, you don't really use the word intervention much. So do you see like that piece as an intervention or are you seeing that more as sort of, um, you know, dis disrupting the, pe the space, or are you seeing it more as um, uh, a continuation of the piece? And maybe there's no difference, I don't know, maybe it's just, but to me when I hear intervention, it sounds like it's, it seems abrupt or No, really, it's, an, uh, it's not, not an intervention, it's an invitation of the surrounding space into right. the piece. And the participation of the volume mm -hmm. in the space in a different form. Right. So it's, it's the, and that's why the, and with some of the pieces where these voids meet each other in the center or in, in sometime inside the volume mm -hmm. become very, uh, a very sort of a logical extension of it because then the space can travel through the volume. 
So it's, it's that narrative that I'm interested in. Right, so I've never thought of yourself because you never think, you never speak of it as, as a subtraction or something negative, like a void. You know, you don't think of it as sort of um, a removal as much as a creation. Yeah, exactly. And That's what it is. Yeah. So, um, yeah. but yet you refer to it as a void, which is inherently has sort of a negative connotation or sort of a, an absence or something. But it's really, but uh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, like you said, it creates this, it's an invitation to um, sort of more expansive thinking, either literally or metaphorically, or even just the, the dynamics within something like this, or like you said, within the space. Right. You know, within that grouping or mm -hmm. within the whole space. Yeah. So you don't think of them as, intervention is not a word you typically use. No. I don't no. hear, okay. Mm -hmm. So it's not like something like Robert Irwin would no, do. No, it, it was an intervention already to, to cut these blocks of wood out of, out of naturally grown right. uh, botany. Right. Yeah. So uh, that was the intervention. What I did is use the residual material to mm -hmm. make sculpture. Oh, that's, well, yeah. So that's, yeah, well, that's what a lot of these uh, other pieces that people can't see mm -hmm. um, is uh, the, where what gets pulled out actually gets reincorporated Right. Into the uh, other yeah, piece. Yeah, so it's not yeah. like it's wasted yeah. or thrown away or discarded. And then you see the, mm -hmm. the leftover uh, natural uh, um, characteristic of the, of the wood mm -hmm. then becomes part of the narrative. Yeah, the, the grains. Exactly. Uh, or yeah. some, in time, sometimes yeah. in, in, in grain and And, and that goes counter. to the extreme when you use fruit and vegetables. Yeah. Because they are you know, individual things and uh, if you have a pineapple relating to a uh, turnip, uh, then it becomes uh, uh, somewhat of a... It becomes uh, a pineapple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to uh, let Yao get uh, hit the camera situated to talk about these, which are new forms. Right. And then we'll talk about the pair back there. Right. Okay? Good.